Oedipus Rex is the most performed and most well-known of all the tragedies to have emerged from classical Greece. The question is why? Why this fame? Already in the 4th century BCE, it was held by Aristotle in his Poetics to be the paragon of tragedy. And then in the 20th century, it entered the psychoanalytical vocabulary of Sigmund Freud in his Interpretation of Dreams. So in this once upon a time world, there is a king and queen who are childless. Now this is a very common situation in myths and fairy tales. Rapunzel, for example, begins this way. When there is no child, there is a sterile environment. The new ideas that are needed to revivify the kingdom or the psyche are absent. The whole enterprise is barren, and the question the tale asks us is how do you resolve it? The great stories always ask questions of us so that we increase our awareness, our consciousness. An increase in consciousness allows for a renewal of the kingdom and of the self. The king goes to the oracle at Delphi and is told that if a son is born to him, he will kill his father and marry his mother. What does the oracle represent? It could be that this is the part of ourselves that sees things from a much larger perspective, a higher perspective, the part that knows what we need and just not just what the ego needs to address the stagnant condition we find ourselves in. Perhaps it's a deep depression or a relationship that is breaking down, but whatever it is, we cannot find the energy that once sustained us. The oracle, the part of us that sees beyond the surface of things, knows that something, a baby, needs to be born and that this new idea or new facet of the self will kill the father and marry the mother. Now, the killing of the father is a very common mythological motif. It signals the killing of the old order and it signals that that is what is needed. Read psychologically, the old forces must be vanquished for things to move along. Of course, the king doesn't want that. The ego never wants to relinquish its control. And so when the baby is born, he drives a nail through his ankles and tells the shepherd to abandon him in the wild where he will die of exposure. Well, we've seen this before. The same fate awaits Snow White. And just as in Snow White, the shepherd can't bring himself to do this. So he gives the baby to another barren couple. In this case, the king and queen of Corinth who raise Oedipus as their own. The maiming of the son by the father is an archetypal situation we all see in the world. Many a father has metaphorically handicapped a child so that he cannot live his own life, his own vision. The reason is always that the father cannot stand to be displaced, cannot grow old. For such a man, his wife is always his mother and his son is always the rival. Many times this is an unconscious process and the father doesn't even know he has done this, but the son grows up to take on the father's unlived life. And suddenly, for example, an artist finds himself in a suit, going to a corporation he despises, all in service to a father's unspoken desire. So Oedipus, this child who has already been wounded by the father's flawed vision, grows up lame in some way because his ankles never heal and his soul is probably equally damaged by this great transgression. When he passes the turbulent years of adolescence, he is told one day at a banquet that his parents are not his real parents and he decides to consult the oracle to determine if this is true. Once again, he is consulting that inner part of himself that has an, an enlarged vision. And the oracle tells him the horrible truth that he will kill his father and marry his mother. And of course, taking it literally, he escapes from Corinth so he can avoid that fate. Of course, Oedipus meets his fate as he's running away from it. He leaves for Thebes and on the way has a confrontation with an old man where three roads meets and kills him, not knowing that he has killed his own father. Now, one thing that all young men must confront is the Red Knight. In the story of Parsifal, the Red Knight is the knight who enters the court of King Arthur once a year and throws wine into Guinevere's face. And no knight at the court can stand up to him because he is so ferocious. The Red Knight energy is that violent, martial energy that we must all tame, but most especially young men, so that they do not go around defacing their own feminine interior selves. 
So Oedipus kills this old man in a rage of red knight energy and then proceeds to the city of Thebes. There he finds that the Sphinx, a creature half woman, half lion, is terrorizing the population. Now Thebes is the anti-Athens. Athens is the place of beauty and order, and Thebes seems to be a place where the forces of the irrational have parked themselves. The Sphinx itself is a brilliant marker for that, and the forces of the irrational can sometimes be vanquished with a rational approach. Now here Oedipus, in answering the riddle she poses, does just that. He uses his great intellect to silence momentarily this underworld power that has surfaced to threaten the city and the psyche. So that is a backstory, but now the play begins. It's many years later, and Oedipus is king. He has married the queen, a widow, and has been rewarded with the throne after having saved the kingdom. But now he's at midlife. He has children with his wife, and he has risen to the top of the mountain, so to speak, like many do at midlife. And suddenly, Thebes has again fallen into disrepair. This happens in many stories and in many lives. The life energy leaves again, and the city and the psyche fall into a deep depression. The genius of the play is how Oedipus's awareness of what he has done and who he is unfolds. He is at once the investigator and the villain, the hero and the anti-hero. His journey is the journey we must all take to increase our consciousness, and it is a brutal one. Only in looking deeply within can we hope to unearth who we are, but it is never easy. As always, it is only through suffering that this can be done. The soul sickness of the individual is mirrored here in the blighted countryside. Nothing can grow, nothing can develop as the psyche and the city are polluted. A raging plague is holding people hostage, and only Oedipus, with his probing into his own past, can heal the kingdom. So Oedipus undertakes the journey not knowing it will end in the defeat of his own ego. The tragic hero depicts the ego undergoing individuation, which is in part a tragic process. We can look at individuation as the ego's progressive awareness of its relation to a higher self, a higher ideal. But as Jung has pointed out, the experience of the self is always a defeat for the ego, and a defeat for the ego is always experienced as a tragedy. As the play unfolds, Oedipus slowly uncovers what he has done. He has killed his father and married his mother. His mother slash wife realizes it just before Oedipus does, and she hangs herself. Upon discovering her, Oedipus takes her brooch and pokes out his own eyes, unable to see any more than he has already seen. Sight is important here. It is a blind seer, Tiresias, who knows that the fault lies within Oedipus himself. And only once Oedipus blinds himself does he fully accept what he has done and who he is. He is now exiled from himself and will make the long journey to Colonus where he will find peace and transcendence as an old man by accepting what he has done and who he is in total. Now, as in all Greek plays, the chorus here behaves as the collective every person who shuns the terrifying journey into truth and into the agony that comes with looking inside. The ultimate reward of this is wholeness, of course, but it requires an unbreakable inner strength. The chorus represents the, quote, those who choose death and unconsciousness instead. The sins that Oedipus commits in the play can be seen as a metaphor for the most frightening aspects of ourselves, which we refuse to accept and acknowledge. You can say that by taking responsibility for what he has done, Oedipus has absorbed that dark side and has become whole. The birth of a whole individual also marks the birth of empathy and the beginning of an understanding of the other. Ultimately, Oedipus the play asks us as human beings to face our own unconsciousness, our own ignorance, because only in accepting and addressing our unconsciousness can we ever hope to grow whole. We are here not to be happy, not to be good, but to increase our consciousness. And as Edward Edinger said, myths promote consciousness, provided that the relevant connection with one's own personal life can be made.